Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. I've been called a lot of names in my life, some good, some bad, uh, some I wouldn't dare repeat. There is a, there is a view that Scripture has about names, uh, names as, as Scripture views them, the creative power of our Almighty God is such that He has only to speak and the thing is done. Psalm 33, 9. That's pretty powerful. There's never been anyone in existence ever be, that's ever been able to do that but, but our God. Because the word spoken is the thing created. Now, typically when we think about this, we think about you know, Genesis chapter 1 where God spoke the worlds into existence. Uh, personally, I believe that, that vocalization is, with God is probably unnecessary. It's, it's much more likely that, uh, that God only has to uh, think and it, it's done. Of course, he didn't choose to do that. You know, we live in a world in which communication is vital. It's key. I, we couldn't even exist without it. Um, for the longest time, uh, ever since I really, going back to my Bible college days, I, in exploring this subject, which has always been fascinating to me, it's the... Uh, the, the idea of the word, word, you know, in all my arrogance as a, as a youthful pastor, I, I, I thought, well, I'm going to write me a book and I'm going to call it the final word on the word, word. Well, I haven't re reached that point of being I, what, I, what I believe qualified to do that. But I do have some insights I'd like to give you concerning uh, this subject. In Psalm 33, 9, the original Hebrew of that verse is very striking. It reads, He spake and it was done. One of the great philosophical and theological debates that uh, that's gone on over the centuries is, is the meaning of the Greek term logos. Uh, many of you are familiar with the word it's uh, most popularly it was thought to have originated with John's gospel, but in fact, uh, that word actually appears in pre-New Testament uh, Jewish literature. We're all familiar with John chapter 1, uh, verse 14. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. So we have the written Word, we have the the spoken word, we have the living word, and so that word, word, is a heavy subject. I think it's a, a subject that most Christians probably don't spend a whole lot of time contemplating, meditating on. Uh, now, you may not be aware of this, uh, but the change, the divine change brought about in spiritual rebirth, uh, it must be it has to be. In fact, it is accompanied by a change of name. You have a new name. I have a new name. Every person I believe that was ever that's ever been born has a new name. Now you may not have, have heard that. Uh, it's before. And it could be true that the non-believer doesn't have a new name. It could be that just believers only, only those who have been born again, who are members of God's family, God's household, that they have a new name reserved for them in heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm not of that mind. I'm, I'm, of, that, I'm of the mind that, that God actually uses everyone to serve His purposes. And, and there's a meaning behind 
names. I've done videos in the past where, you know, uh, uh, Fauci, you know, his name means sickle, reaper, uh, you know. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, of interesting facts concerning a name that we may not fully understand why some people are named one thing or called one thing and, and some people are called another. And you may have a name that seems inconsequential, may not seem like it means much at all. Uh, Fred, <laughs> you know, I, I just threw that out there. Uh, Tom, Dick, Harry, <laughs> you know. I, I just think that, that there's something about a name. Now, when I was uh, a, a young child, my, I remember asking my mother, you know, how, how, did, how did you come around to naming me Stephen? Well, the answer that I got was that my, my parents were, uh, my mom had become pregnant with me and uh, uh, her and my dad were sitting around one evening trying to decide what to name me. And they were uh, watching a TV show called Steve Allen. This was back in the 50s. I was born in 1956. And according to my mother, I was named after Steve Allen. Uh, because Allen is my middle name, uh, Stephen Allen, they liked the, the name Stephen. Uh, they preferred that over Steve. But she told me that I was named after st some show that they were watching on TV. It, it took me years before I, I, it suddenly dawned on me that my parents really didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about what to name me. But I believe that in every case, every single case, there's something supernatural, something divine about the naming of an, indiv of an individual, that where God has a hand in it, uh, despite what we as parents uh, might think when naming our children. I got a horse, his name's a Choctaw. I named him Choctaw. I named him Choctaw because we live in Choctaw country here in o southeast Oklahoma, and we live on, on a street called Choctaw Place, and I just thought, well, he's a, he's a young four-year-old Mustang. Uh, I thought, you know, he's, uh, the name Choctaw would be appropriate, and so I named him Choctaw. Uh, we can't help but think about, when we think about this subject, we can't help but think about how that God brought the animals to Adam to name. And so this, this subject really does uh, cover a wide scope of, of, of subtopics. Uh, but we're gonna, I, I wanna try to at least shed a little bit of light on this uh, for you uh, and try to explain this in the way that I understand it. Uh, this new name that God has given us, uh, I believe it sums up the, the new personality. Uh, this new name is written in heaven according to Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. It's kept secret for the present. Uh, we don't know our new name. That's, that's kind of fun in a way. It's kind of interesting to, to think about that God has a new name reserved for us in heaven and that He hasn't told us what that new name is. And I believe that there's, if we searched uh, high and low, we might at least get some concept, some idea as to perhaps why God chose not to reveal that to us now. But He did give us a new name, and that is, name is written in heaven, and it is kept secret. And this new name is appointed uh, to the child of God by the divine giver of names uh, who I believe you know, in foreseeing precisely what kind of person that the individual Christian will grow into as a work of God because we are His workmanship. Uh, he's able to make it entirely appropriate even though that personality has yet, to, has yet come to to fruition, I mean, even though we are, have yet to become, uh, reach full maturity, you, I might, you might say. Uh, the, the biblical view 
the biblical view of the, of the experience of the new birth, uh, which leads to the formation of a new personality, uh, requires the appointing of a new name. Every Christian that's born again is, has a new name given by God, the giver of names, the divine giver of names, and it's reserved in heaven. It, it requires the appointing of a new name. It actually requires it uh, because it involves a great spiritual experience. Every, every Christian has his own unique experience. Uh, we're not just uh, collectively sort of like, I guess, you, you know, the Borg, you know, we're, the, you know we're, we're all members of the one body, the body of Christ, but we're not so inconsequential that, we don't, that He doesn't know us by name. In fact, uh, you know, when we read in the Old Testament all the genealogy and so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so and so on and so forth, you know, which many Christians come into those passages and they, they find that pretty dry and boring and they can't understand why God would mention all that. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to suggest that, that what I believe there, what I believe is what many others believe, and that is, is that uh, it was God's intention for us to see in that just how important we are to Him. That He knows us by name. Uh, so this uh, requires the appointing of a new name. New birth requires that because, because of, well, m many factors. One being we're adopted into a new family, Galatians 4, 5. So we're, we're born again by God, uh, not of the flesh, not of us. It's a new birth is, as I pointed out in a previous video, you know, uh, it's, it's, there's nothing synergistic about it. Uh, we did nothing to become a child of God. As many believe, many believe that, well, we, we became a, a child of God by believing. Uh, it was only because we were a child of God that we could believe. That's what I'm going to say. That's what I've always said. And it's what I always believe. That's what this book says. But we were ad adopted into a new family, the family and the household of God. And we were begotten of God, born again, regenerated by God. We are His offspring. And God, and this is an important part, and I've pointed this out in the past before, God does not... Here's what He doesn't do. Uh, he does not... You know, in... In being born again and begotten by God, anything that God begats uh, is perfect. Just like he, when He spoke the worlds into the, to existence and everything was perfect. Uh, just, you know, when, he, uh, when we become members of God's family, God's household, uh, we become a new creation. All things, old things have passed away. All things become new. So it's perfect. And we have a new man uh, as new creations, we have a new man that is sinless, according to 1 John. Uh, and it cannot sin because his seed abides in us and we cannot sin. The new nature is sinless. Now, we have an old man that does nothing but that. And there's where Christians get confused. Well, Steve, are you saying that we you know, are, are sinless? Because... Steve's scripture clearly says that we are not sinless. That if we, if you, if we say we have no sin, well, the truth doesn't abide in us. So, but I think that the problem comes in when we don't recognize the dual nature of the individual. We are no longer a single-natured individual. Now, the non-believer, the unredeemed, the non-elect. They are single-natured individuals. They are sinners. They're not saints. And therefore, they uh, are neither perfect in any way. In fact, uh, all that the old man does is sin. But, but they are uh, incapable of uh, producing anything righteous. The plowing of the wicked, it, Scripture says even the plowing of the wicked is sin. But... 
but we're, we were adopted into a new family. Uh, that's Galatians uh, chapter 4, verse 5. We have victory over a powerful enemy. That's Romans 6.14. We have a new nature. That's Colossians 1.27. And, and we have a new man. And we, we need to distinguish between uh, being a new creation and having a new man. We, as a new creation, we have a new man. Of course, we, God chose, deliberately chose, not to remove your old sin nature you know, at your new birth where that you no longer had a body of sin. He deliberately intended that that not be the case. Of course, it wouldn't have worked out very well if he had. We'd just be all be a bunch of Jesuses, little, little Jesuses running around. So, but we have a new man and with all of these, all of these, uh, the, the adoption, the, the victory over, over Satan, the, uh, the new man, the, the, uh, all, all of these uh, sort of wrapped up, I guess you might say, in one single transforming experience. And, it, and since that's so, I mean, is it really surprising, should it surprise us, that we as believers have been renamed? You know, I kind of like my name. I always, Stephen means crown, you know, garland, uh, wreath, you know, victory, you know, that sort of thing. It's also associated with uh, Stephen, the Christianity's first martyr. Uh, never had a problem with my name, Stephen. Now, I, just as you, I, I have no idea what my new name is in heaven, but it kind of intrigues me to think about the fact that I do have a new name reserved for me in heaven, as we all do, and I want to share a few thoughts on that. I hope to be able to, sh to shed some light on my, my thoughts concerning that. You know, this new uh, personality, you might say, is, is, is a work of God in, in the Christian life. It's by the enabling presence of Christ to, uh, who actually enters our heart uh, and begins to express Himself. Um, thereby enabling a character which is perfect because it, because it is Him, it, it is Himself, and which is now the, and, I'm, and please don't misunderstand me, I'm not by any means saying we're gods or we're God, but uh, it, it's perfect because it is Himself and, and which, which is now the real inner man which God sees and which is entirely pleasing to Him, entirely pleasing to Him. It can't be anything, you cannot be anything other than entirely pleasing to God. First of all, He's been propitiated. Uh, Christ's sacrifice was fully sufficient. God's uh, justice regarding sin was satisfied. Uh, your, all your sin was laid on Christ. So, and so to this extent, Christian experience, your new life itself this new life that you have in Christ is, uh, is God's way of reintroducing the person of Christ into the world. It is, in fact, Christ in us, which is the hope of glory. It's, it's, uh, our, the hope of glory is not our own merit, our own success, uh, our own uh, working, th you know, through our own efforts to try to, you know, uh, let allow uh, or bring about the, you know, our a situation in which our successes far outweigh our failures and that sort of thing. Uh, Christ in us, the hope of glory, and only by accepting the fact of the new birth, which is disputed among many people today. Uh, they don't even believe in that. Uh, this fact of our new birth. Not, not our personal devotion, our personal, uh, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, sacrifice, our own uh, uh, nothing of ourselves. It's, it's not, not our personal pizzazz or, or anything else. It's only by the new birth that we can properly account for the fundamental change that takes place. 
any change that's taken place in your life has been a result of God's work, not yours. He even gives you the faith to trust Him. That is a divine gift. So it's all His work. Uh, we can't take credit for any, any of this. Uh, a, ch a change all the more asso properly associated with a, an entirely new name. Because this new person who emerges is indeed the Lord in us. It's not I, but Christ. We're going to look at that in chapter 2 of Galatians in our, our study coming up in, in our study uh, on Sundays. So it's, it's completely appropriate uh, that it should be said of us in Scripture that we are, we are called by His name. 2 Chronicles 7. 2 Chronicles 7.14 We are called by His name. That's how we were called. By His name. Now, we are called by His name not so much because we are so... Man, we're so awesome. You know, we're so, we're so Christ-like. Or because we're labeled by others as Christians. That guy's, that guy's a Christian, so, you know, he's Christ-like. Well, I guess there is some basic truth to that, but it's, it's not because of our new personality. But it, it is because, I believe, because our new personality is part of his personality, and therefore our new name is his name in part. Now, in part, okay, where I'm not... I'm not, I'm not suggesting in any way that, that we as individuals are on a level equal with God, even name-wise, but collectively, as members of the body of Christ, all collectively members of the one body, we, are, we have been so closely identified, folks. Uh, you are, listen, you are not God, uh, despite what you might think, some of you at times. You don't compare to His glory, uh, but you do exist on this, this planet. You exist on this earth just as He did in the flesh, sinless without fault. That is a fact. Now, you may not live like it. You may not even believe that. But that is a fact. And you have been so closely identified uh, with him, and that word "identified" is where we get our word "baptism." It's, it's, you know, if you took and dyed a, 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 a white piece of cloth in in red dye, you dyed it, and and the cloth is now red. It's, it's, that's the word "identified," uh, and we have been so closely identified with Christ, it staggers the, the imagination. It's, it, it boggles my mind just how closely that we have been identified with our Savior. Uh, we, we've been so closely identified with Him that the only thing that really separates you from your position in heaven is the fact that you are not there yet. That's the only thing. It, it, it's amazing because we, we as believers have been given the awesome privilege of walking as He walked on resurrection ground, as those who are alive from the dead. We died to sin, self, law, the world, Satan, and even death itself. When, when we was crucified, we were crucified with Him. When He was buried, we were buried with Him. All our sins were taken and removed as far as the east is from the west. We were raised with Him to walk in newness of life that's not some newness of life that you decided that you decide you're just well. I'm going to turn over a new leaf, Steve. It's it's the newness of life is his life. There there is. I want you to really try to wrap your mind around the fact that there's something very metaphysical about all of this. This is this is not nothing. There's nothing human behind the operation of any of this, but it's divine. And the only difference between what you are now and what you will be 
is that body of sin that you, well, you just can't seem to get rid of, that you hate. Hopefully you hate it. I, I, I'd, I'd say you do. If you're a Christian, you do. Because, and the reason why is because you can't be a new creation, be given a, a new sinless creation in which now there's a conflict between the flesh and the Spirit and you not hate sin. And I, as I pointed out in a recent video, uh, I think the last video, I, I pointed out the fact that I'm fully per persuaded that most of, uh, well, all of us, basically, all of us uh, Christians, are, we, we sin more than we want to. We're already sinning more than we want to. Now wrapped up in the uh, in Jesus Christ as the second Adam, he's referred to as that the second Adam is the sum total of all personality that man can have. Just as it was originally in the first Adam, though undeveloped, you know, because we know what happened there, the fall. Uh, since it's the Lord who, uh, being planted as a seed in the believer's heart, begins to unfold himself in some small measure appropriate to the individual, so our new personality is formed out of his, and we are therefore properly given in some way part of his name. It's as though all. It, it, it's as though all of the new names, all of the new names of all the children of God, when added together, will constitute His name. And in this sense, His name is above every name. And we are collectively, collectively called by it. You know, one of the, one of the comforts allowed to the saints of the Old Testament was that they were, they were assured that God knew them by name. The Lord said to Moses, Thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Exodus 33, 17. This does not mean that God merely knew who Moses was, but something much more important, namely that He knew, he knew what Moses uh, well it, it it wasn't that he just knew who Moses was, but he knew what Moses would be. You know, I believe that when God calls us by name, he's really saying two things. Uh, the first, that we are his, his creation. Uh, and the second, that he knows us perfectly, perfectly. I think there's a lot of comfort in, in, in this fact because He knows us perfectly. He knows our hopes. He knows our fears. Our, he knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. He, he knows us better than we know ourselves. And if we think, well, you know, we kind of know ourselves, well, we don't know ourselves as God knows us. It, that really shouldn't surprise us, but it, the fact of that, of that matter should bring tremendous comfort in our life especially when it comes to so-called failure. He knows our past. He knows our future. We haven't yet attained to the character which, which God has before ordained that we should attain to. And therefore, while our new name is, is an exact description of what we will be, it could not yet be appropriately applied to us. So it's kept secret for the present time. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. Your name, your new name is kept secret. There's something to look forward to. I mean, as if you didn't have you know, an, an, enough already to look forward to. So certain is the ultimate attainment of that which God has appointed for us in the matter of personality development that the, the new name, which sums it up perfectly, has been engraved in stone, folks. In stone. As the passage in, in Revelation tells us. 
You know, there are some who believe that when Jesus stooped down, as the woman taken in adultery stood in the midst of her accusers, you know, that's in John chapter 8, and he wrote with his finger on the ground. He was, in fact, writing down the names of her accusers, or at least one of them, the, the, the chief of a uh, leader. Now, there is a passage in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13, which reads, They that, de listen, they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Okay? So what I want you all to know is that the name of the child of God, your name, your new name is engraved in stone, not in dust. You know where it gets blown away? Or sand, you know, or like, like the house that's built on a poor foundation. We have in Scripture a number of people who acquired a new name. One of the most common that you're probably familiar with is, is in the case of Paul. We have an example of the absolute sovereignty of God in affecting His will even when the subject himself was utterly opposed to it. This is what so fascinates me about Paul's conversion. He, was on a, he wasn't seeking God. He wasn't loving God. He wasn't working for God, serving God. In fact, he hated God. He was putting Christians to death. He, his conversion on the road to Damascus, he was struck blind. He was, he was, it wasn't some decision on Paul's part that he made, and he's our prototype for those who would there, hereafter, thereafter believe, which is you and me. Uh, but when Saul was converted, uh, he didn't immediately receive a new name. Uh, he, he was still being referred to as Saul after that. Uh, we know that from Acts 13. He continued to be called Saul until there came the, the significant words there in Acts 13.9, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And this was his character thereafter. It was that he never looked back. He never returned to his old way of life. He'd received a... a a, a new name. Now, I don't think that that's his new name in heaven, but it was his new name given him on earth. And, and ne he never longed to be anything but this new man. And, and so he's never again after that referred to as Saul. Now with Jacob, uh, the story uh, is, well, otherwise it's, it's difficult to be absolutely sure of the significance of Jacob's wrestling with the angel. Uh, many of the Jewish commentators, they, uh, it, in discussing that event, they, they built up a number of stories. Uh, some say that the slight uh, a limp uh, or stoop you know, which is detectable. They, they think in Jewish people as they grow older uh, was inherited from the wound that Jacob received when the angel touched his thigh. Uh, much later in history, it was believed that when our Lord said, when you see these things come to pass, lift up your heads. Uh, that's Luke 21. He was really saying, straighten up. You know, since redemption was nigh. Uh, whatever truth or or, or fancy there may be in these traditions, one thing is certain, and that is that a profound change took place in Jacob himself. And to signify this change, he was given a new name, and that new name, as you know, many of you know, was Israel. But Jacob wasn't always called Israel thereafter, and in like manner, his descendants were not always referred to as Israel either, but under certain circumstances as Jacob, and uh, although I haven't, I haven't really followed through all the passages of Scripture which might be used as proof text, there is no doubt, there's no doubt that upon many occasions, both Jacob himself as an individual and his descendants 
as a nation were referred to as uh, Jacob or Israel, uh, either Jacob or Israel, depending upon whether they were uh, behaving in the character of the natural man, which was Jacob, or the supernatural man, which was Israel. Uh, there's many passages, uh, more than just a few passages, in which the distinction is brought out in a striking manner. Isaiah 9, 8, uh, we read, The Lord sent the word unto Jacob, and it, and it has lighted upon Israel. So uh, clearly that looks forward to the time when the word was made flesh and he came, Christ came to His own, and His own received Him not. Uh, John 1, 11, even though some did. And to those who did, He gave the power to become the sons of God. Because these were the ones who received the light. These these were uh, like kind of like Nathaniel. Uh, they were true Israel. They were Israel indeed. Now, as the prophets looked forward to the time when the nation would be brought into terrible judgment, there was to be a time of Jacob's trouble. Nevertheless, as Paul was much later to assure the household of faith, in, in the time of that great tribulation, all Israel would be saved. Romans chapter 11. You know, Paul virtually he clinches the distinction which I'm proposing here by pointing out that this will come about because God shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Romans chapter 11. There's also no question at all that all men, saved and unsaved alike, doesn't matter who you are, are at times servants of God. Used by God to carry out His will. We see that clearly in Scripture. And uh, you can uh, confirm that by looking at Psalm 119. And, and so that in the, the total economy of God, the whole program of redemption, uh, God's program of redemption, all men play their little part, either knowingly or unknowingly, but they, they play that part. And in this sense, the Christian, the Christian is also a, a servant, even as the Lord was a servant. But the Lord also told His disciples that because they had entered into a new relationship with Him, they hadn't ceased to be His servants, but it had become something much more than that. And that was personal friends. You are a uh, friend of God. That Basically, that resulted ultimately from the fact that they were elect, they were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. Uh, because His very next words to them were, You have not chosen Me, but I've chosen you. So it is not surprising, uh, I don't think, to find this same principle applied in the Old Testament in a way that bears out what we've said about Jacob's two names. In Isaiah 45, it's written, For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect. Now, when we make our request to God uh, in His name, This, this may actually mean something more than merely making our requests for His sake. By pronouncing His name, there may be a sense in which we are gaining a certain power uh, provided that we do indeed uh, know the Lord and we do in fact know His name. We're told in Scripture that we may command Him, Isaiah 45.11, I, th I think that whether we really know the name we use in the, in the sense of knowing the person whose name it is or, or, or merely making noises, as it were, it is quite clear to the Lord Himself. In a crowd of people where uh, several share the same name, you know, the way in which one particular individual addresses another by that name immediately reveals he doesn't that he does know that person is quite distinct from any of the others who may happen to share the same name, just as the 
Lord called Mary's name at the tomb, you know, when she had failed to recognize his voice up to that up to that moment, and he was immediately identified. I think the Lord knows when his name is being appealed to rightly and when it's uh, merely being used, I guess what you'd say, you know, ritually. Folks, you have a new name reserved for you in heaven. I gave up trying to figure out what mine was going to be a long time ago. I figured I'd just wait for the surprise. But folks, there is power in words. I, I, don't, I don't even know how there could even... Well, we know that there couldn't even be a creation without words, without the spoken word. It's how we communicate with one another. I don't think we'd do very well as homo sapiens if we, uh, couldn't, if we were just all a bunch of uh, mutes, you know, uh, couldn't communicate with one another, maybe just go through life using hand signals. Or... It's that important. It's, it's that important what we say because words are powerful. The words that I speak to you can have great power or none at all. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I hope you found this as interesting as I have. I invite you to take and explore the subject deeper. It is a fascinating subject. Thank you for watching. Join us on Sunday as we study through this amazing book of Galatians. Until then, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.